The prolonged spread of coronavirus has stalled and stopped activities in the oil and gas sector, tourism, aviation, among others. Countries are left with no other option but to seek help from multilateral institutions to ease the impact of the virus on the economy. Joining us now is Michel Agatsi, a commercial lawyer at Olaniwo Ajayi. Thank you for your time with us on the news. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Uh, did African economies come into the global crisis on a strong footing? Um, African economies did not come into this pandemic on a strong footing. Um, we had several instances where countries were already seeking to, um, you know, renegotiate their debt. Um, with multilateral lenders, you had instances where health infrastructure was not already in place, and you had instances where there was already a total, total failure of public service. So with all of this um, and moving into a pandemic, um, it was always bound to be a recipe for chaos. Um, but one thing that's good is the fact that um, many of the African countries came into this pandemic um, at a point where they understood that Europe had already been faced with the bad end of the brunt, China had already been faced with the bad end of the brunt. So the good thing is that um, we took early action that the rest of the world did not take. And we hope that um, at the end of the day, that will make all the difference. What are the implications of our level of readiness post COVID-19? Well, I think um, taking that question would require one to take a step back first and look at our level of readiness pre-COVID-19, um, because that would then set out what the future will hold. Um, I say this because um, there are specific um, economic variants that have to be looked at. So a country like Nigeria, for instance, relies on crude oil. A country like Ghana relies on cocoa. Um, a country like South Africa relies on gold. Now, all these type of raw materials would have a different uh, market post-COVID-19. We've already seen the fall in the prices of crude oil as a result of lockdowns. Lockdowns mean that there is no transport, planes are not flying, manufacturing hubs are not working. As a result of that, the demand for crude will fall. However, Lockdowns also mean that people will rededicate or reallocate um, their resources toward basic items, basic food items. So a country who ex exports um, agricultural produce, for example, will be much better placed post-COVID-19. Why? Because countries reallocate resources toward food. I'm sure you saw that the United Nations already predicts that post-COVID-19 we might even have a new sort of um, issue to deal with, which is a biblical sort of famine. You know, and a country who has invested over time in agriculture will be better placed to survive in the COVID-19 world, whereas a country who exports diamonds on the continent might not be better placed post-COVID-19 just because that is a luxury good that the rest of the world might not be, um, you know, so demanding of okay. post-COVID-19. So I think really the investments that have to have been made, should have been made. However, the next best time to make those investments are now, right? right. And um, I think the allocation of capital should now be focused on what the world will need post-COVID-19 in order to ensure that the economies, especially the economies of African countries, um, can ride this storm, continue to deliver the benefits um, to their people. A number of African countries produce oil. Nigeria is one of them. However, cost of production differs across board. How would the drop in oil price affect oil, de oil dependent countries? Yes. Well, the drop in oil prices is going to be um, a very difficult one to ride out of. Um, in Nigeria, for example, the cost of production of oil hovers around $15 per barrel, whereas the cost of Brent crude currently hovers at $11 per barrel. So if we're producing at $15 and selling at $11, it's not rocket science that you're making a loss. What that means is that investment opportunities for new greenfield or brownfield projects in the oil and gas sector will not take off. Secondly, it also means that the potential for there to be shortings of production um, is bound to happen. And the reason is because there's a glut in the market. Um, further down on 
on the continent, a country like Angola, um, also has significantly high levels of production. Um, sorry, significantly high cost of production of oil. And they haven't been able to recover from the slump in oil prices in 2014, 2015. So this is a double whammy um, for economies such as that, you know, because they are already are striding what Venezuela faced. Um, so I think for us, um, you know, the distinction is really between the deep offshore and the, and, and, and the onshore production. Onshore production is much cheaper than deep offshore production. Deep offshore production, it's likely that we would see less of that moving forward. Um, it's likely that the IOCs might have some shutting of production because they cannot store the crude that is being produced now because of the glut in the market, and they cannot refine that crude that is being produced now in the market. However, um, Goldman Sachs already um, you know, predicts that if we're able to have a vaccine or a medication that you know steadies the ship in terms of the COVID-19, then it is the case that we might see very quickly production coming back on stream. If we see production coming back on stream and countries trying to make up for all the time that they had been locked down and coupled with the OPEC production cuts, we might actually, before the end of the year, see a situation where demand outpaces um, supply. If that were to happen, hopefully, we might then see a situation where we have oil prices again going to the 60s, 70s, and right. 80s. However, that is dependent on an assumption that we don't know the answer to. All being, right, uh, when will COVID-19 end and how will COVID-19 end? All right, Michelle, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you for having me.